What's up guys, it's Dwayne back again for another video, back again for another reaction and today's a great, wonderful, beautiful day because it is a Sweden day. What did Sweden do in World War II? That rhymes. <laughs> Scandinavia's neutral power, 1939 to 1945. So you guys stayed neutral. Okay, without further ado, let's get into this reaction, let's go. In this series, I've looked at the roles of countries not normally associated with the Second World War and asked what did they do during that most famous of recent conflicts. Mm. Well, in today's video, I'd like to shine that spotlight on Sweden and what Sweden did during the Second World War. Now, if you look back at Sweden's history from the Vikings and through to the Great Northern War and its struggles with Russia, it's quite a warlike history. So it might surprise you that after around 1809 with the Napoleonic Wars and 1812 with the last invasion, Sweden had actually remained at peace and would do so until the start of the Second World War in Europe in 1939. Sweden, it sounds like you guys were like, ah, we do not want to get involved in any more wars because wars are expensive. They're very expensive. They're very taxing to economies. And also they, you know, they're not nice and people die and you want to protect your society. So I'm not surprised that you've had such a turbulent time in your past with a lot of wars and then you decided, you know, we're not going to have a war for a very, very long time. So... During this time, Sweden became a lot smaller geographically as it essentially shedded Finland, which became a new country to its east. During the First World War, Sweden decided to remain neutral. And in the post-war years, there was a very strong socialist movement in Sweden that was generally split between a smaller, more radical communist wing and a more liberal social democratic wing, both of okay. whom wanted to bring about reforms. At the same time, there was a backlash from more conservative and right-wing parties, a similar situation to what was seen throughout most of Europe in the post-First World War years. This communist faction was emboldened by the fact that in 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution broke out in neighboring Russia. And in the following years, the Russian Empire yeah. would fall following the Russian Civil War and would be completely replaced by the world's first communist government, the USSR or Soviet Union, which was aided mm. by many of the Swedish communists who wanted to spread that communist revolution into Sweden as well. It was during wow. these years in the early... So you guys could have been part of the Soviet Union if the communist... Uh, Swedish people got their way. That's a scary thought, isn't it? 1930s that Sweden decided its best position with its ruling Social Democrat government was to stand between the rising powers of the Soviet Union who threatened Sweden directly and the rising march of the Nazis in Germany. During these years Sweden maintained a neutrality between the rising powers in the East and the West thinking that this okay. would spill out into a war in the Baltic if the situation wasn't managed. Sweden also started to prepare for the worst, investing more in its military and in 1936 investing in two new tank battalions and two years later in 1938 men above the age of 15 were conscripted for short periods of time and some of them were kept training in order to prepare the country's defences. The balance I'm, not of I'm not surprised, wouldn't you do that? You would definitely do that because there's war breaking out all over and you're like, well, we need to... We need to protect ourselves. We need to get these young people ready just in case they decide to come and invade. You could have been invaded by the, the Russians. You could have been invaded by the Nazi, Nazi Germany. Like, you, you're stuck in the middle. Very much stuck it's in the middle. power that Sweden hoped would keep the Soviets and the Germans occupied with each other and therefore not interested in expanding into Sweden fell apart in 1939 with the signing mm. of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact which brought the Soviets and the Germans together after they planned to partition Poland. This, of course, would spark the powder keg that would set off Europe into the Second World War. And Sweden, for its part, retained its stance of neutrality, even as the Western Allies prepared for another war with Germany. In doing so, when the Polish submarines attempted to escape Poland and went into Polish waters, they were indeed captured and its crews were interned in Sweden for the duration of the war, as Sweden was a neutral country and, in essence, this was a violation of their territorial waters. Sweden, however, did not take it as likely when the Soviet Union started its winter war with Finland in November of 1939. 
And during right. this time, the Swedish public and certainly many of its politicians were in favor of helping the Finnish against the Soviet Union. Even if this never led to a direct declaration of war, they did change their stance from neutral to non-belligerent. Non-belligerent. So it's like, yeah, we're not going to start nothing, but if you start it, we're going to bring it. <laughs> Basically, that's what non-belligerent means. It's like, you know, and I don't, I don't, I don't blame you guys just for stepping in to help Finland. I mean, Finland used to be part of Sweden, and you're the, it's one of the Nordic countries. So, you know, they were getting attacked from one side, and if Russia spilled into Finland, and then they did take over Finland then obviously then that would put Sweden at risk and it makes sense to protect the interests of the people and many Swedes up to the around 8,760 volunteered to fight alongside the Finnish against the Soviets around 70,000 Finnish children were also evacuated to Sweden during this period and wow. there was a lot of tacit support from Sweden's government in other means towards so if the 70,000 Finnish were evacuated to Sweden, there was a lot of evacuations in, the, in Britain as well, um, but if that many, that many children moved to Sweden, does that mean a lot of the Swedish pop population have ancestors that are from Finland? Let me know in the comment section below, and let me know, because I've got a lot of Swedish um, subscribers, Statistically, if 70,000 in 1939-1940 moved, uh, moved to Sweden, 70,000 Finnish people, then I'm guessing one of my subscribers would either be a product of a Finnish immigrant or knows a Finnish immigrant. Does that make sense? <laughs> Let me know in the comment section. ...towards Finland in their war against the Soviets. In 1940, the war would come even closer to Sweden as the Germans invaded Denmark and then oh leapfrog God. over and invaded Norway during this time as well. Denmark, of course, would famously last only a few hours, while the campaign in Norway would span several months with Allied involvement. The Swedes who had their forces amassed on the border with Finland in case there would be decisive action from the Soviet Union if they had broken through Finnish defences were due to be sent home. But with the invasions of Denmark and Norway, Sweden feared that it would be next and would need to mobilise its forces. However, the Germans had insisted that Sweden not mobilise its forces or this might be taken as a reason to invade Sweden as well. And so they were able to, wow. instead of bringing this force of 100,000 men into mobilization, the Swedes sent individual letters to the Swedish homes to bring the forces up and to give them the information of where they should assemble for their mobilization rather than an official mobilization, thus bypassing the Nazis' demand that they not actually mobilize their forces. And in this way, in a short time, they were able to raise an army of around 320,000 men to mobilize and started to prepare defenses along the border with Norway. In 1940, right. the Swedish also started to prepare their own Home Guard, a paramilitary force that would work together with the official military if indeed Sweden were invaded. During the Germans' campaign in Norway, they demanded of the Swedish government access to telephone and telegraph lines going through Sweden, which would allow wow. High Command in Germany to communicate more efficiently with its forces deployed in Norway. The Swedes agreed to this, but at the same time they tapped these lines, and in doing so Arne Berling was able to access the German Geheimschreiber, similar to the more well-known Enigma machine was used to okay. code messages between the German army. And in doing so, thanks to Berling's efforts, the Swedish government was able to listen in on the military intentions of the German. And in fact, to do this, the company Clever. Ericsson, which we now know from the more famous Sony. Sony Ericsson after its merger, actually built machines to be able to decode 
the encryptions that the German army was sending using these devices. After figuring this out, the Swedish government passed this information on to the Polish resistance, who were then able to communicate it with the Western allies, thus giving them an advantage during the war thanks to this Swedish code break. For example, the okay. allies were able to find out where the Bismarck was located in northern Norway on several occasions because of Swedish intelligence. If you're looking to invade Norway and want to hide some private, personal or military or otherwise information, then today you'll be glad to know that NordVPN can help. This is a virtual private network oh, that no. secures your connections when you're away from It's a from terrible home. sponsor, let's skip it countries forward. To the fast movie, to the good, he'll be a huge Nord self-blockaded connected. With the battles in it. Norway raging on, Sweden found itself blockaded by both the Germans on the North Sea side and the Allies, as well as in the Baltic. This was a great problem for Swedish trade and its economy plummeted as a result of being blockaded on many sides. There were still some in Sweden who did try to trade on, but many Swedish seamen became the target of both German and Allied vessels during this time. Sweden was also in an uncomfortable position, lodged between the Axis-aligned Finland and the battles raging in Norway where the Germans were gaining the upper hand. Indeed, mm. during the Battle of Narvik, the German government requested to transport its troops through Sweden from northern Finland in order to take part in the battle. Sweden had actually allowed this under the pretense that these were medical personnel, but in reality there were ten times as many combat soldiers and heavy equipment on board these trains as the medical personnel, and the Swedish government was found afterwards to have been aware of this fact and yet to have given in to the German demand anyway and allowed the troops to be transported. In 1941, a similar thing happened when the Germans were preparing for Operation Barbarossa against the Soviet Barbarossa. Union. The Swedish once again allowed German soldiers to be transported using Swedish trains and through Sweden, something which caused a great scandal and a deep division in Sweden and indeed after the war when this was seen to have been collaborating with the German regime. It's also true that around 37% of Sweden's exports were for Germany because the Baltic, basically the largest coastline that Sweden has access to, was basically controlled by the Germans who had occupied Poland and who would later push into the Baltic states as well. It's also true that Sweden was the largest supplier of iron ore to Germany from a neutral country during the Second World War. Well, I mean... Sweden was working in its best interest. It's got, to, got to be honest. Even though human rights violations were massive, and what Germany did at that time, not outside Germany, Nazi Germany did at the time, um, was horrific. I don't think. I, I I think Sweden was thinking in the best interest of its own people. It is what it is something which caused great controversy and which Winston Churchill famously spoke about, saying it must be understood that an adequate supply of Swedish iron ore is vital to Germany. The effectual stoppage of the Norwegian ore supplies to Germany ranks as a major offensive operation of the war. No other measure is open to us for many months to come, which gives so good a chance of abridging the waste and destruction of the conflict, or of perhaps preventing the vast slaughters which will attend the grapple of the main armies. And indeed, before the Allies had been ousted from northern Norway, there was actually a plan to swing across the north of Norway and invade Sweden in order to capture this vital resource. But wow. this never ended up <clears throat> happening. Around 180 Swedes ended up joining the Waffe SS, the elite Nazi troops of the German army. However, wow. this is quite a small number compared to others in different countries that were, of course, occupied by the Germans and indeed from several other neutral countries, as the Swedish government had made it illegal to join the SS. Around 8,000 Swedes, however, also joined the Norwegian resistance and several Swedish merchants also became blockade runners to supply things like ball bearings and other goods 
to the Allies. Of course, if these ships were caught by the Germans, they would a lot of the time be blown up for trading with the enemy. As a neutral country, Sweden played an important role as a safe haven for those seeking to escape the Nazis, particularly mm. in neighboring Norway, with whom it shared a long border, a lot of it through very treacherous terrain of mountains and forests. However, around 50,000 Norwegians did flee into Sweden during the war. And following 1943... So there's a lot of Swedish... Um, Norwegian, sorry, people that have, I'm guessing, ancestors who were part of the war in Norway um, who now maybe currently still live in Sweden. I'm guessing. Uh, do you guys know anyone that was had a grandparent or great grandparent that's from Norway and they f they came to Sweden during this time let me know when it looked like the Germans were on the back foot on the eastern front the Swedes decided to relax some of their policies as they no longer feared that the Germans would mount an invasion of their country if they didn't comply with the Germans win everything and in doing so, from these 50,000 Norwegian refugees, most of whom would be held in Småland or Södermanland, they decided to create the Norwegian police forces of around 15,000 men. The reason being that they were police forces is because they didn't want to antagonize the Germans too much, but essentially these forces received weapons training, and this was in all intents and purposes, an army ready to take back Norway from the Germans that was being trained by the Swedes. And in 1944, these Norwegian troops that had been trained in Sweden, together with Norwegian troops that had made it to the United Kingdom and fought under the British Army, were able to liberate an area in northern Norway. Okay. There was also a force of Danes who were able to get into Sweden. Of course, this was more difficult as they would have to cross the sea, the sea arm, to get into Sweden. And these numbered around 3,600. And in 1945, with the liberation of Denmark, they were also called in to help. Now, before the war, lots of Jewish refugees had made their way to Sweden to avoid persecution by the Germans. However, Sweden had turned most of them away. But in 1942, okay. they decided to change their policy and allowed Jewish refugees into the country to seek asylum from the horrors being committed against them. And around 900 Jews from Norway were able to find safe haven in Sweden. And while this isn't a huge number, this was around half of the entire Jewish population of Norway at the time. And wow. in 1943, one of the stunning... Again, so Jewish, the Jewish population of Sweden, I'm guessing a lot of them probably stayed in Sweden. Um, I wonder how big that population is now. And I wonder if any of my subscribers uh, have ancestors from the Jewish population in Norway in 1943. Let me know in the comment section below. It's really interesting. Feats of survival during the war is that around 8,000 Danish Jews, which was the vast majority of the Jewish population in Denmark, were ferried by Danes across the strait with Sweden and brought to safety there. And wow. during the war, the Swedish also provided around 9,000 Christian or atheist Danes with safe harbor to s stop being persecuted during the occupation. Let me know if you're also a, a Danish Jew. <laughs> also true that the king of Sweden at the time was also trying to use his position in aiding the Germans in some things to plead for a more humanitarian approach to the Jews, that they wouldn't be treated as terribly as they were by the Germans. Although, of course, this was to no avail in the end. In 1945, the Swedes were also part of a plan called Operation Rede Danmark, which was the plan of Operation Save Denmark to bring in Swedish soldiers to potentially aid in an allied takeover of Denmark from the Germans. They would also allow the Americans and other allied forces to use Sweden as the base of their operations for bombing runs against German-occupied Denmark, although in the end, this wasn't needed. Okay. At the end of the war, Sweden had been more on the side of the Allies, aiding them in potential invasion of Denmark, which of course never got off the ground, although they had remained neutral for much of the war. However, they had also been very pragmatic in their neutrality. 
helping the Germans in some ways and allowing them to transport troops through the country, but of course, more importantly also, supplying them with the iron ore that they so desperately needed. And especially the British were not pleased with the Swedish in the slightest for doing this as they had oh fought tooth and nail against the Germans the entire war. The Soviets too demanded that the Swedes give over of many of the Baltic SS troops that had fled into Sweden following the collapse of the Nazi German Reich. The problem was that many of these had come from countries like Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania which had themselves been occupied by the Soviets in at the start of the war and they knew that many of them by handing them over to the Soviets would be put to death in labour camps and yet they were forced to hand them over which caused somewhat of a political crisis in Sweden at the time. But that is it for this video on Sweden in so the interesting. War. I hope you've enjoyed this video because many... I did. I mean, I didn't know... I didn't know the extent to Sweden's involvement in the Second World War. I actually thought you guys were completely neutral. But actually, it was impossible. It was impossible during that time for any country to be neutral in Europe because it was just happening everywhere. And... <laughs> The proximity between you guys and Russia and Germany, it's impossible, like it was going to happen. And um, yeah, I, it was a horrible time for a lot of nations. And yeah, I think we could just look back at that time and learn from, from those mistakes. And hopefully that will never happen again. Um, I do think Europe is a, a lot more of a unified front than we've ever been um absolutely i don't think i i think if there's gonna be a a, a war it's definitely gonna be a west east divide rather than within europe i think we've i think i think i think europe has learned from that horrible time but guys that was yeah very interesting very very interesting if you have not checked out my Patreon, check out my Patreon because we have Film Friday and we're watching two different TV shows. So we're watching Clark, which I absolutely love. I've watched the first episode and I'm like, this is an awesome TV show. <laughs> and we're watching Alt for Swadia. Um, we're on season three, episode three, so you're not too late. Um, and, 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 very exciting, I am starting a Swedish sound Sunday. So tomorrow I will be reacting to some music, some Swedish music that I've never heard before. So that's a tear on my Patreon because I don't know much about Swedish music. I don't know about, much about Swedish artists. And also YouTube doesn't like me putting music on YouTube. I, it gets blocked. So um, I have to put up my Patreon, but it's good because I get to hang out with you guys. So if you guys want to check that out, the link is in my description. I will see you guys very soon. Have a great weekend.